we're going to discuss or what we're going to share with uh, everybody uh, for all the participants is the uh, socioeconomic impacts uh, of marine oil spills and uh, to the way of presenting to a case study. So before we start, uh, I would like to have some ground rules uh, in this uh, webinar. So the first ground rule, uh, we would like to get the participants to be respectful at all times. So by being respectful, an example of that is please make sure you don't write uh, your questions in all capital letters in the chat. Uh, I'd like to reiterate to keep your microphones uh, at mute. If you have questions or you have messages, please use the chat box and uh, we will attend to them uh, towards the end of the presentation and we will answer your questions and respond to your messages. Um, please note that this session will be recorded and the recording will be uh, made available uh, to everyone, everyone who attended this webinar. So let me do a quick introduction of myself. I am Norman Ramos, uh, a principal trainer and consultant for OSRL. I've been working for OSRL for the past uh, seven years and five out of those seven years I've been working as a trainer uh, for OSRL. So my contact details are provided in this slide. Uh, you can reach me at telephone number uh, 6266-1566 or you can email me uh, at normanlamos at oilspillresponse.com. So if you have further questions about this webinar or anything about oil spill preparedness or response in general, you can reach me in, uh, in this uh, manner. So let's start. So um, let me start the webinar by saying that um, in my experience as a trainer, uh, every time we talk about spill, uh, impacts of spill, uh, most of the time, I would say 90% of the time, uh, the participants or the course participants or the delegates that we have, they would all, almost always tell us the impacts of oil spill to the environment, on the environment. So they will talk about ecosystems that are damaged during, uh, during an oil spill, uh, like a seagrass meadow, uh, like this photo here, or a coral reef, and some of them would talk about the impacts of oil spill to the wildlife, uh, like seabirds uh, and turtles, marine turtles. So they think about in, in this way. So most of these are all in terms of environmental impacts. Uh, other environmental impacts that our delegates would always think about are, aside from the ecosystem, are the sensitive shorelines. So sensitive shorelines would include uh, mangrove, especially in our setting here in Southeast Asia, we would have a lot of uh, uh, mangrove forest along the coast. And they would also talk about um, wetlands uh, that can be impacted by an oil spill. So all of this uh, are about environmental impacts. Uh, it would be seldom that you will hear or the participants will talk about um, impacts on the socioeconomic basis. So why, why is that so? Um, that answer, we will not dwell into that question, but what I would like to talk about today is uh, getting you to think about not only the impacts of the oil spill in the environment, but also the impacts of oil, uh, oil spill on a socioeconomic basis. Uh, the reason for that, or the main intention for that, is to open our minds, uh, especially when we are um, uh, attending a spill or we are preparing for a spill, we have to open our minds, especially when we are prioritizing uh, assets. Uh, by assets, I mean environmental and socioeconomic assets. So it's, oil spill is not only about the environment, but we also have to think about that oil spill would also have, again, an effect uh, in the socioeconomic aspects of the community. So let me give an example of a socioeconomic impact of an oil spill. So uh, let me give you this case study. Uh, this is a, a vessel collision incident that happened back in 2017, uh, in January 4, uh, this is about three years ago. 
So OSRL was uh, mobilized by the spiller uh, on that date, and we were demobilized on 11th of January 2017. Although we were uh, demobilized on the 11th, uh, the cleanup was finished after a couple of weeks after January 11th. But uh, for OSRL, our participation is from January 4 to January 11. Uh, the spill happened in Pasir Gudang, uh, Malaysia. So let me just show it to you on this map here. So this is where the spill site or this is where the, the, the uh, collision happened. Uh, the collision uh, it's between these two container vessels and the product that spilled was uh, a fuel oil of viscosity 500 and the quantity of the spill is about 500 tons. So if I can uh, again get your attention to this map on this upper right hand corner. So this is Pasir Gudang. This is a, a port in Malaysia. And as you know, a quick geography lesson, uh, Malaysia and Singapore are quite close uh, and it's separated by uh, the, what we call the Nenas Channel and Selangun Channel. So this part here, this is Singapore. And also this uh, island here, this is called Pulau Ubin. So this is also part of uh, Singapore. Uh, this upper right hand or this, this upper part, this is the Malaysia and this is the uh, Pasir Gudang uh, port. So as you can see, uh, very proximate Malaysia and Singapore. So uh, what happened was uh, after the collision, uh, after the spill, the spill um, traveled or crossed the boundary towards Singapore. And the photo here shows the point of impact of the uh, collision. And this is, well, again, the casualty uh, vessel. So again, this happened in Malaysia, but uh, the spill went to Singapore. So two countries were affected by the spill, Malaysia and Singapore. So as you know, uh, oil spill doesn't need passport to move from boundary to boundary or country to country, as we always say. So just a quick uh, uh, moving more of uh, what are the impacts or, or in, in Singapore. So one of the most impacted area is what we call the Pulau Ubin, okay, this island here. So this island is still part of Singapore. And Pulau Ubin is quite famous in, in, in Singapore. Uh, if you want to see rural area, this is one of the last rural area in Singapore. Uh, as we know, Singapore is a uh, a highly urbanized country, but if you want to find, if you want to have a look or have a feel of what a Google Singapore is like, you have to come to Pulau Ubin. And this Pulau Ubin, this was highly impacted during the spill. And Pulau Ubin is also known as a, as a park uh, in Singapore. And the dots here, uh, which I'm going to insert right now, so this dots here and dots here, and you can see also some of the dots in here. So these dots, uh, actually these are fish farms uh, that's littered uh, around Pulau Ubin. So there's a lot of fish farm uh, activity around Pulau Ubin. And most of these fish farms, if not all, were highly impacted by the oil spill as well. And one of the um, aspects of Pulau Ubin that was uh, affected as well is the Czech Java. Uh, Czech Java is this part. Okay, Czech Java is, um, is a quite unique uh, sensitive area in Pulau Ubin. Uh, this Czech Java has about seven ecosystems in, 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 in general. And it has mudflat, it has mangrove area, so there's like um, a number of uh, ecosystem in, in, in Czech Java that was affected as well. So some of the photos uh, of the oil spill. So this photo here, uh, this is the photo, uh, this one of the jetty that was affected in Pulau Ubin. Uh, and some of it also went into the mangrove forest in Pulau Ubin. Uh, some other, another jetty that was affected. And as I have mentioned, a number of fish farms that is uh, surrounding the Pulau Ubin was heavily impacted or heavily affected by uh, the oil spill that happened. So some photos uh, of the fish farm that were impacted. So as you can 
you can see the uh, oil spill is quite viscous, it's quite thick. And not only fish was impacted, uh, but also some of the shellfish uh, that was raised in those fish farms. And in this photo here, this is one of the owners, or uh, yeah, one of the owners of the fish farm who were doing some uh, emergency sort of recovering of the oil. So by using the uh, sorbent pads. So uh, the sorbent pads, actually the fish farm owners, they don't have anything uh, to address an oil spill. So actually all of the sorbent pads came from AVA or the Agri Veterinary Authority of Singapore. So they were given the sorbent pads uh, that could assist them in uh, getting or recovering some of this oil spill. Other photos, so as I have mentioned, um, the, vis the, oils, the oil that spilled out is highly viscous, as you can see from this photo. Uh, and this photo, actually, they are checking the condition of the fish that was impacted. And in terms of the financial impacts and losses, uh, the vessels that uh, collided to each other, uh, they were requested by the Malaysian or they were uh, obliged by the Malaysian government to have a uh, 1 million uh, ringgit bond. So the 1 million ringgit bond is about $300,000 each. Uh, this is the insurance that the vessels uh, would not report uh, because they have to clean up and pay up for the cleanup of this oil spill. And it was estimated the cost of the cleanup is about 5 million ringgit. So it's about 1.6 million in Singapore dollars at that time. Uh, other financial impacts and losses. So the 12 fish farms that were highly impacted by the oil spill were ordered by the AVA, the Agri-Food and Veterinary Authority of Singapore, uh, to stop the fish sales uh, in January uh, after testing. So they tested that the fish has a cons considerable amount of oil. So they were asked to uh, suspend their operations and suspend their sales. Uh, but the suspension was lifted uh, in March 2017. So after two months of the spill, after the spill happened, uh, it was lifted. The owners that were affected by the oil spill uh, needed to rebuild their fish farms bottom up. Uh, so that means whatever fish farm that was affected or has oil in it, uh, they have to demolish it and the owners have to rebuild their own fish farm. And this costs about between 300,000 to about 1 million Singapore dollars, depending on the size of your fish farm. So basically once a fish farm uh, has been impacted by oil, it's useless. You cannot reuse it again. Uh, thus you have to rebuild a new fish farm. And please take note that this um, spill happened close to the Lunar New Year or the Chinese New Year. Uh, the Chinese New Year at, uh, in 2017 fell on January 28th. Um, as uh, if you don't know, uh, culturally, uh, if there's a Chinese New Year, one of the main dishes that is being served uh, during Chinese New Year is actually fish. So um, as you can see, because fish sales was affected by the spill, uh, so however, NBA mentioned that um, there was in minimal impact to the supply, but however, you could still see at that point in time uh, that there was a slight increase in the prices of the fish. So although minimal impact to the supply, but um, it was observed that there's a, a bit of rise in the prices of the fish that was sold in Singapore at that time. So these are all the financial impacts uh, and losses. So this is the losses incurred by the fish farm owners these are the losses incurred by the vessels that, uh, that, that uh, spilled oil. Uh, aside from that, uh, other losses or other community losses that I could tell you is that because Pulau Ubin was affected by the oil spill, uh, Pulau Ubin itself was closed from the public uh, for the duration of the spill when they were doing the cleanup. Um, Pulau Ubin was closed from the public. So somehow it affected uh, the community who were like uh, of frequent visitors to that island. 
So, how did uh, OSRL respond to this uh, type of scenario? So, there are three areas where oil spill or oil, oil spill response limited uh, focus their strategy on. So, they looked into uh, three areas. The first area is the fish farm cleanup. Second area is the offshore uh, containment and recovery. And the third part, part of it is the shoreline cleanup. Although uh, we did start the shoreline cleanup, but most of it were done by the contractors of MPA, um, Maritime Ports Authority of Singapore, and NEA, National Environment Agency of Singapore. So although three areas were, were, were identified by OSRL, we did work mostly on the fish farm cleanup and on the uh, offshore uh, containment and recovery. So for the fish farm cleanup operation, our focus were on the fish farm cages and netted areas with fish stock. So the fish farm structures are our secondary priority. So we focus on the cage and netted areas. Uh, somehow we would like to preserve uh, whatever fish stock that's in there. Um, so how did we do it? So our focus, so we have a three-stage uh, process for the cleanup. So we isolate the whole netted area. So consider this fish farm. So we isolate that. So we want to prevent what oil that has been trapped into the fish farm uh, from um, uh, entering the fish farm. And we don't want what uh, oil that has been captured by the fish farm to go out back to the sea. So what we have done is to um, surround a fish farm with oleophilic snares. Uh, or we call it the pom-pom pom-pom uh, pom snares. And these pom-pom snares are supplemented by sorbent booms. And also we did remove the free floating bulk oil within the uh, cages, uh, within these cages. We removed the oil, the bulk oil there using the uh, vacuum skimmer, uh, as you see from the photo here. This is one of our colleague who uses the vacuum skimmer on one of the cages. And also we use pom-poms uh, because the, these pom-poms are really good. Uh, it's one of the best uh, oleophilic snares or one of the best approach that you can use if you have a very viscous oil. And also we use um, pom-poms and sorbent pads uh, for residual spots and sheens uh, within the fish farm, uh, fish farm area. Now you would say why do we call it pom-poms or why do we say uh, or you feel it steamers we call it pom-poms uh, because actually it looks like this huh? so these are your all you feel all you feel like snares or your pom-poms it is reminiscent of the pom-poms that uh, the cheerleaders use uh, uh, when they're doing their uh, cheerleading act so some of the photos that we use are some of the photos that we have during the fish farm cleanup. So the, again, this is one of our uh, colleagues at the time who were installing the pom-pom snares and the sorbent pads, uh, making sure that there are no gaps uh, along uh, at the perimeter of the uh, fish farm. Uh, this is the sorbent pads or sorbent booms uh, that we use uh, in the fish cages. Uh, this is the used up sorbent pads and pom-poms, which has been uh, with, with oil. Uh, and this photo here is actually, these are the sorbent pads that the owners, you know, just they threw to the cages at the start of the, uh, at the onset of the spill. So uh, it looks very wasteful, but uh, we can, what, what I can say is I, I, I don't blame the owners uh, at the time. Uh, because uh, it is an in, in, in the emergency phase, so uh, whatever equipment or whatever material they have, uh, they use. So that's why, as you can see, there's a lot of sorbent pads uh, in this photo. So that's what we have done for the uh, fish farm uh, cleanup operation. And another main thing that we have done is the at sea containment and recovery. So. We use two types of booms uh, during our operation. We use this type of boom, uh, which what we call uh, the harbor buster. And at the start of the spill, uh, at the onset, 
first for the first three days, we also use what we call this uh, boom, which we call the low boom, right? And another important aspect that we consider uh, during our at sea containment and recovery is we use a lot of um, waste uh, containers like this, this waste tanks here, as you can see on this photo. We use a lot of this because we expected a lot of uh, oil that will be floating at sea. So as we don't want to have any hassle or we don't want to have downtime during the uh, operations, we ensure that we have enough sufficient uh, waste tanks uh, during the operation. So again, this photo here shows uh, the harbor buster uh, once you have deployed that. And this photo here, this actually shows you the oil that we have collected and also the, the debris together with the oil that we have collected during the uh, at sea containment and recovery. So uh, although we prepare for our tanks, we also have some uh, waste management tanks also, or waste management kits uh, for the oil uh, solids. So some of the things that we have done uh, as a response strategy, some of the uh, support that we have. So we use two, uh, one, 200 meter offshore uh, boom. Uh, as I have mentioned, this is what we call the low boom. Uh, we use two harbor buster, two units of harbor buster. So actually, I am one of the lead who did the at sea containment. So I used harbor buster at that time. Uh, we use a number of vessels of opportunity, about seven vessels of opportunity, uh, one workboat and uh, one response craft. So don't, don't, these are the numbers of vessels that we have used uh, when we are uh, doing the at sea containment and recovery. Uh, I think one thing that we should be, I should be mentioning here is that when we are doing the at sea containment and recovery, uh, we have to be mindful of the boundary between Malaysia and Singapore. So that means uh, our vessels, uh, we are not, um, we, are be, we are being mindful not to cross the Malaysian border uh, because they might, that might end up into uh, a dispute. Uh, although it's not a big deal, but however, we are uh, being mindful of that. At the same time, when we are doing the at sea containment recovery, we can see the Malaysia, our Malaysian counterparts who are doing the same thing. So you would, you would see that they are also very careful uh, not to cross the boundary between Malaysia and Singapore. And literally when we pass uh, in opposite directions, uh, it's very close. Uh, it's just like 50 meters away and you will be seeing your counter, uh, we are seeing our counterparts in, in Malaysia. And every time we pass by, we do wave at, at each other. Okay. So I would like to do, uh, uh, before, uh, before we do a quick q and A, I I think um, based on this case study, I would like to reiterate that again, uh, this is case study um, tells us that, you know, impact of an oil spill is more than an environment. We also have to think about the socioeconomic effects. Uh, socioeconomic effects, like what I have mentioned, would be the financial losses, uh, both the vessel owners and the fish farm incurred during the spill. Uh, aside from that, um, the business disruption uh, that the oil spill uh, has uh, the effect of this uh, effect of this oil spill. So business disruption to the vessels because they have to stay back in Malaysian port because they have to clean it up, clean up the oil spill first before they can move. Uh, and also the business disruption, to the fish farms that were affected, which um, they were uh, like the, the 12 fish farms, they were not able to sell fish or they were not able to uh, grow fish, rear fish for, the, for, for two months because they have suspension uh, placed on them. And other community, uh, socioeconomic uh, with regards to the community would be the closed out of the Pulau Ubin for its frequent visitors. So as you can see, these are just some of the examples of the socioeconomic impacts of marine oil spill. So why am I saying this? So why am I emphasizing on the socioeconomic effect? Um, I would like to, uh, to get this webinar for, uh, to tell the participants that when you are planning, 
uh, when you are thinking about prioritizing, when you are thinking about um, which assets needs protection, uh, you should not only consider the environment, but also consider uh, potential businesses or potential socioeconomic assets that might be disrupted as an effect of an oil spill. So having that in mind, another important thing that we must remember as, uh, as professionals under oil spill preparedness and response is that in the area of operations that we are working on, uh, it would be important for us to identify what are the assets that are proximate to our, uh, to our operations. Uh, by having uh, identified this, by mapping this out, we understand that you know, uh, if there's this a lot of assets in our operation, then I, I can prioritize uh, easily, I can prioritize much better or I can make my decision, my decision making will be uh, much better off if I know uh, what are the assets around my operations. So for this uh, case study, I'm not downplaying the environmental impacts, uh, but what I'm just saying is that proper consideration is also given to the socioeconomic as you give to an environmental impact. So basically, when you do your decision, uh, we have to come from a holistic point of view uh, so that uh, all of the stakeholders, all of the assets will be taken care of. Okay, so that's the main thing that I would like everybody here to understand. Uh, uh, again, it's not downplaying environmental impacts. It's just telling you that aside from environmental impacts, we also have to think about the socioeconomic impacts. So just a quick Q&A for our participants. So what I would like you to do is to uh, scan the QR code uh, or go to uh, www.menti.com, uh, enter the code 941087. Uh, there's one multiple choice question and I would like you to choose the letter of the best answer. Okay, so let's uh, have a Five, three minutes for this activity. So can I get the participants to uh, scan the QR code or go to the uh, www.menti.com, enter the code and then answer the question. So let me stop sharing my PowerPoint and I will share this menti.com. So basically the question that I posted uh, in the menti.com is what are the main factors to consider when prioritizing assets? Uh, is it the spill location, proximity to assets, the type of oil or all of the above? Okay, so 10 of you answered. Uh, okay, what are the main factors to consider when prioritizing assets? Uh, okay, so somewhere people answering. Okay, is it all of the above? Uh, is it the type of oil, the spill location, or proximity to assets? 
Okay, I think everybody has uh, provided their answer. So I will show you the show. Uh, I will show you the correct answer. So again, the question is, what is or are the main factors to consider when prioritizing assets? Uh, assets here refer to environmental or socioeconomic assets. So let me show you the correct answer. Okay, the correct answer is actually all of the above. Mm. Uh, so why all of the above? So these factors that uh, we mentioned, uh, although this is not an exhaustive list, uh, all of these factors uh, need to be considered when you prioritize assets. Uh, the spill location, definitely, when, when or where the spill happened. Uh, this will be important because it also answer how proximate this location to your assets. Is it very near? Is it very far from your environmental or your socioeconomic assets? Uh, aside from that, what's the type of oil that spilled out? Is it, um, is it a hydrocarbon or is it a crude oil? Is it a very viscous oil? Or is it a processed hydrocarbon, right? So these are all, are all of the things that need to be considered. But uh, again, the list is not exhaustive, but the answer to this again is all of the above. All of this must be considered uh, when you are prioritizing your assets. Okay, let me share again the uh, slide. Okay. So uh, we are nearing the end. So some of the key points that I have mentioned, again, based on this webinar, as, I, as we have discussed this webinar by uh, having a case study, again, I would like you to recognize as, as a professional of uh, uh, oil spill preparedness and response, I would like you to recognize that marine oil spills have socioeconomic effects uh, in addition to environmental effects. So what does that mean? It means that when you are planning, when you are prioritizing, you have to consider both socioeconomic as assets and the environmental assets which are proximate or within your operational area. How are you going to do that? So once you recognize this fact, it would be good to identify an inventory of assets. So what will be the assets around your operation area? Uh, are you surrounded by fish farms? Are you surrounded by ports? Uh, do you have sensitive shorelines near your uh, area? So all of this must be identified. All of this must be uh, put in an inventory and that will make your decision making easier in an event of a, uh, in an unlikely event of an oil spill. And again, as I have mentioned, when you do a decision making, when you make a decision, it should be based uh, from a holistic point of view of assets. Holistic meaning uh, you're not only thinking about effect, again, effect on the environment, but you're also thinking about business disruption. or also thinking about what would be the effect on the community. And other aspect would, like, would be like, what would be the effect, for example, if this oil spill um, impacts a cultural area, for example, which is also under a socioeconomic aspect. So all of these are the key points uh, for this uh, webinar. So I will uh, stop at that point uh, and we will uh, go now to the questions. So I would like to hear or would like to see whether uh, there are questions from, um, from the participants. How long was the overall, so from Sharon from OSRL, so how long was the overall response operations? So uh, OSRL um, did the oil spill response operations from January 4 to January 11, so about a week. Uh, however, the total number of weeks for uh, the whole operation to be cleaned up, it's about two to, uh, two to three weeks, uh, although OSRL participated for the first week or so of, of that oil spill. How many people were involved? Uh, that's a good question. So for us in OSRL, um, I would say easily the number of uh, personnel that were involved from OSRL side, uh, including our subcontractors, is at least uh, 40 plus uh, because we have a lot of vessel of opportunities that we need to manage. And uh, at the same time, we have people in our emergency operations center 
which uh, they do our planning, which they plan our operations for uh, for that week. So about uh, at least 40 people were involved. Uh, and the funny thing about <laughs> uh, the funny thing about spills, I don't know if you have experienced this. I hope not. But most of the time, uh, spills happen during. Um, season uh, you know during those festive season uh, like this one uh, this uh, this happened near the lunar new year huh? uh, so normally our experience in oyster air if it's near the festive season somehow somewhere uh, an oil spill might or potentially might happen okay so uh, from jeffrey what happened to the recovered oil um osrl is not um, involved really on the uh, on the how to say um, although we collected the oil we collected the waste uh, however this waste wa was uh, taken from us uh, taken by MPA from us and MPA dealt with uh, with this oil that has been recovered uh, but in Singapore we have a, a, a law with regards to uh, hazardous waste so oil that has been spilled at, uh, at sea, uh, this will be considered hazardous waste. And this hazardous waste will be uh, uh, transported and treated by accredited contractors. And normally this will be used or this will be uh, disposed using incineration. So that's what happened to the recovered oil. Uh, from Robert, how much is the total cost for the cleanup? So that's, uh, that's a quite a sensitive um, uh, information to divulge, uh, but for OSRL, I would say this is uh, somewhere uh, at least 500,000. I may not be able to tell you the actual amount that uh, amount that they paid us for this, but definitely the total cost um, is more than that uh, because uh, please take note that we were paid this amount only for one week, uh, but this cleanup lasted for another uh, two to three weeks. So. It's more than that. Uh, actual amount, I may not know the actual total cost, but at least for OSRL, it's somewhere about uh, between 500 to 750,000. Who took, who took the control? Uh, this is from uh, Jose. Uh, who took the control, Singapore or Malaysia? So that's a good question. So for spills that uh, process the boundary, who will take control? So basically the, the spill or the oil that was in Malaysian side, this was took over by, my, by Malaysia government. Uh, but the oil that passes or goes through Singapore, uh, this was controlled by uh, the Singapore government. So the two countries are, are quite clear uh, with, regards to, uh, with regards to obligations, with regards to the responsibility on uh, where their responsibility, their obligations end. Uh, with regards to cross-boundary uh, spill. And just to take note, uh, Singapore, Malaysia, and Indonesia have an agreement um, with regards to oil spill and with regards to marine safety. Because as you know, Singapore, uh, Malaysia, and Indonesia, uh, they, the, the states of uh, Malacca and states of Singapore passes through these three countries. So these three countries have an agreement with regards to marine safety and have an agreement with regards to spills such as this. So they have, uh, they have an agreement in place. So uh, roles and responsibilities between these countries are not difficult to, to establish because of that uh, agreement. Uh, from Dwight, how could you qualify the involvement of the authorities in local companies during response? So he got two questions. Did you detect any non-operative issues to attend the uh, emergency? How could you qualify the involvement of authorities in local companies? Okay, uh, I guess uh, if I understand your question correctly, how could you qualify? Now for Singapore, uh, any marine oil spill, or which means any oil spill at sea, uh, the default um, regulatory or uh, government agency, government authority that will take charge is the uh, uh, Maritime Port Authority of Singapore. So they will be the ones uh, be leading the effort on the cleanup. So uh, that's, that's for the Singapore side. And uh, what happens is that 
Singapore, the NPA will have their own way or not their own way, but they would have a set of things to do to address the scale. At the same time, they will be coordinating with the responsible party. The responsible party at, at this point would be the spiller or, or the vessel. So they will be coordinating with them and they will be uh, asking this spiller or what or, on how they would address the spill so that they will have um, a sort of ally, uh, um, alignment with regards to addressing the spill. Uh, qualifying or quantifying, again, this would be different from country to country. It's just that here in Singapore, the one who will be leading the, the efforts would be the government authority, which is the MPA. I think Hoyo, uh, Hayo uh, okay, yeah. has a question in the very beginning. He was referring to the cost that you mentioned. Are those costs including the cost, the loss of earnings or just the replacement of the fish farms? Oh, that's a good question, uh, Hayo. So the, the $300,000 the, the $300, dollars that only uh, talks about the cost of uh, replacing the fish farm. It doesn't talk about the loss of earnings of the fish farm for the duration we're in. They cannot sell the fish or for the duration we're in, uh, they are rebuilding their fish farm. So that 300,000 to 1 million is just replacing their fish farm. Thank you, Norman. And can Hayo also has a second question that say, can you share a bit about the interaction or the role of the agencies in identifying and prioritizing this environmental, social, economy, etc. And how do you actually finally arrive at alignment of the prioritization? That's a good question again. Uh, very good question. So um, let me just give a context of how it works in Singapore. Uh, in Singapore, if there's a marine oil spill, uh, the main um, government authority that will uh, or, or government agency that will take the lead is our MPA or the Maritime Ports and Authority. Okay, uh, The MPA itself, they have their own or MPA has come up with a, a sort of an, a contingency plan, uh, although this contingency plan is not, uh, I would say, not published, but they have this contingency plan and, and from this contingency plan, they would be, a, they are, they are able to identify, be able to tell, uh, prioritize what are the uh, environmental and socioeconomic assets that needs to be prioritized or needs to be protected. And normally we have this, um, so during consultations, during discussions with MDA, uh, we will be providing them with our, uh, or SRA will be providing them uh, some of our recommendations on how to or, or which asset would need uh, utmost protection or utmost priority. And at the same time, uh, how do we protect or how do we respond to such, um, uh, to such incidents uh, that, or such effect that these uh, assets have incurred. So most of the time, uh, I would say the alignment uh, that we have is through uh, meeting uh, with the MPA. So we have regular meetings with them. Uh, all throughout the duration wherein we are involved in the spill. Okay. Thank you, Norman. There's a question on the um, what sort of interaction or consultation did OSRL give to the local fishing authorities? Okay, so I think uh, that's uh, another good question. So again, uh, this talks about um, how the authorities work in Singapore. So uh, again, in, in Singapore, the uh, authority that is leading the spill would be MPA. Now, if other agencies would need some advice, what they do is that they will course through this question through the MPA, and then MPA will ask those questions through the spiller, and then spiller will ask the question to us. Whatever recommendations we have, we will pass that to the spiller because the spiller is our basically our uh, uh, they they engage us to do the service. So we will pass that information or recommendation to the spiller. Then the spiller passes it back to the MPA, and then MPA will pass it back pass it back to the uh, say for example the local fishing authority. So for the local fishing authority that is under AVA, so if they have questions on how to protect the fish farm, so 
those questions will not be uh, AVA will not be going directly to us, but AVA will go to MPA and then MPA go to the responsible party or the spiller and the spiller will go to us and then uh, we pass on the recommendation to the, to the responsible party, responsible party to the MPA, MPA to discuss that with the AVA. So that's how it works. So whatever um, relevant government authority, uh, they will be, uh, basically MPA will be the focal point. So other regulatory agencies or authority that has question, they will course that through MPA. So basically you're just talking to one uh, government authority. So there's no loss in miscommunication or I would say uh, misunderstanding in that way. So thank you, Ian Harrison, for your question. I hope uh, Norman has answered you. Uh, if not, then could further clarify or let us know uh, some more questions that are coming in. Uh, we still have time for about one or two questions. Uh, before that, uh, I think there might be a question on everybody's mind because this is like a tran transboundary system. So were there any bureaucratic barriers uh, worth mentioning and taking note of, Norman? Oh, bureaucratic barrier. So, um, as we experience, because as you know, uh, I would say one of the most transparent or and the most efficient government in the world. So, for us working with MPA, uh, we didn't have any uh, bureaucratic barriers that we encountered. Uh, but again, this is a transboundary spill. Uh, we are not able to say because we didn't work with the uh, authorities in, in Malaysia, so we don't know uh, whether there are barriers in, the Mala in our Malaysian counterparts. Uh, but what I can say is that for the Singapore authorities, uh, we had good relationship. Uh, we have uh, no barriers, I would say no major barriers or no significant barriers that we encountered uh, when we were working on this spill. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Yeah, if not, uh, we have come to the end of the webinar and thank you all for joining us. Uh, we hope that you find the session interesting and useful. Um, do let us know what topics you would like us to include for future sessions. As you can see from the slide here, we have an events page on our website listing the upcoming webinars. Uh, to date, we have all the webinars lined up for May as well as some in June, which we are still discussing. So we we'll like your input on what sort of topics you'd like us to um, talk about. Thank you all for spending some time with us. Uh, if you have further questions about today's webinar, uh, as what Sharon mentioned, uh, please do, you can reach me to this email address. So please uh, keep yourself and your family safe uh, during this pandemic and hope to see you again. Bye everyone. Thank you, have a nice